So today what I want to show you how to do is how to turn uh, actually a decanter, a wooden decanter, out of um, some really pretty hardwoods using what's called segmented turning. So what's segmented turning? Segmented turning is basically turning a shape on the lathe, kind of like a bowl or pretty much anything that you would normally turn on the lathe, only instead of using a solid block of wood and removing all the material on the inside of it, segmented turning allows you to do the same thing with less wood waste and giving you the ability to do unusual shapes and maintain an interior wall thickness, which is important when you're doing things with long, thin necks and things like that. Doing that out of a solid piece of wood becomes difficult reaching in and hollowing out the interior. So for example, we'll take and cut strips of wood, strips of hardwood like this piece of walnut. We'll take those strips of wood, we'll bring them over onto the lathe, and I'll show you, we'll, I'll use the wedgie sled or any other um, jig that you can come up with that you can cut accurate miters or angles on your wood. So for the segment that I want to turn, I'm go, I've chosen to do 12 segments. So what does that mean? So we're going to take a circle and we're going to divide it into 12 pieces. We'll have 12 pieces of wood around that circle. Since the circle is 360 degrees all the way around, each segment, if we divide 12 into the 360, each segment is going to take up a 30 degree um, chunk of that circle. So each side of that segment then will be half of that angle, so 15 degrees. So that means that every single piece of wood that we cut out of our solid piece, out of our long strip, is going to be cut on 15 degree angles. And we're going to cut 12 of those and then glue them together into a ring. Once we have a number of rings assembled, we can glue those rings together and start building up our product. Okay, for example, right here I have 12, 12 pieces of ironwood and they've been cut to 15 degree angles on either side and when, we put up, when I put them all together, they will form a ring. We'll glue this together, put some clamps on it, get it glued up and I'll show you that in a minute. And once this ring is dry, we can then surface it and glue another ring on top of that. And we'll build those rings up until we wind up with the um, size and shape that we want. The nice thing is, as we are doing this, we can put this on the lathe and face it, make it nice and smooth so the next ring can glue to it. But at the same time, I can cut the interior because it's exposed and I can start, as I change the shape, I can continue cutting the interior and following the wall up into the, the end of the piece, maintaining wall, whatever wall thickness I want inside there, actually very easily. I can even coat, pre-coat the interior of it before I get to a position where I won't be able to get um, finish in there anymore or it becomes difficult to get finish in there. So, um, these are just some pieces that I cut that I used for calibrating my wedgie slip. You want to make sure that you get your, you use some scrap pieces first and here's some, this is some pine that I cut. And these strips I cut first and I assembled them and made sure that there were no gaps on any of the joints. And if there were gaps, I adjusted the sled to reduce those gaps to, to basically nothing. Once you've got your sled calibrated, and I would recommend checking it first with some scrap wood, and then once you, where you're satisfied that, you, or, you know, that it's cutting correctly and cutting perfectly, then commit to your hardwood or your uh, product project wood. Okay? So... Let's start gluing some of these things up. There, are, there is software that you can purchase. 
Uh, I use a, a software called, called Returning Pro. And basically what it does is you can lay out the shape in the software, what you want, and it will tell you how big to make each ring. So the, you can see the, um, the longer I make this back length, the bigger the circle is going to become. The shorter the piece, the smaller the circle will become. So these little guys are fairly small, and you can see that there's only six or six of them, so there's a half a circle here. But you can see that this is going to make a much smaller circle than these, because the back length, the, the effective length of this segment is much smaller than the length of this segment. So as this gets bigger, your rings will get bigger or smaller, and you can use that in your um, design to regulate what, your, what each ring is going to do. Okay, so once I have my scrap wood um, and I've adjusted my, my miter jig or whatever jig I'm using to cut my wood and I cut all my pieces, the next step is to glue it all together and um, mount it onto the lathe. Going back to how did I determine what size I need, I use this software because I designed a shape on the software and it tells me the very first layer is going to be a solid disc. That's going to be my base. That's what everything's going to get glued to. Then the next thing is going to be a, a segment like this. And it tells me what the length, the segment length is, and it even tells me what my board length is. So I know how long of a board do I need in order to get 12 segments this size out of a, a one board. That makes cutting a lot easier. Uh, and planning. I know exactly how much wood I need to rip down to certain widths. So for each layer or each ring, there's a layout. And once they're all built, then they can be assembled and turned. And I'll show you all how to do all that in a, in a few minutes. Okay, so let's go over to the assembly bench and we'll start gluing some of these. Well, actually, we'll, I'll show you just quickly ripping to width because it is important that you get the width of these things correct. Before we head over to the table saw, the first thing we have to do is joint one edge of each of the boards, giving us a nice straight edge that we can use against the fence of the table saw when we're ripping our, our strips. Then it's just a matter of ripping the strips down and preparing them to be cut on the wedgie sled. Wedgie sled will put the 15 degree angle on each of the sides. Um, and then you'll see we also created an adjustable stop that goes up against the fence there. There's the, the steel ruler. And I'm adjusting the size of the length of the back of the um, segment for this particular ring. So then it's just a matter of cutting um, first the angle on the end of the board and then flipping it to the other other side of the wedgie sled and completing the cut. And then it's just going back and forth from one side from one um, fence on the wedgie sled to the other. There's 17, 30 seconds was the size. Pretty much got it dialed in right there and then it's just a matter of going back and forth and then each cut will produce one segment and those segments if everything's adjusted correctly should be pretty much ready for assembly then it's a matter of just dry fitting them to make sure that We've got a the right amount and it's easy to lose track of how many pieces you got you can see here I, I start counting them because it looked like I had an extra one I was like wait a minute so I put my finger on one and count from that one around to make sure I don't lose count turned out that was just an extra one that's probably for the next ring so we press everything down get everything smooth and tight with the hose clamp 
make sure there's no gaps between any of the pieces and then set that aside with the other ones. So here I have a silicone mat to glue on. It makes it a lot easier to clean up. Nothing sticks to it. And you can see the segments getting glued together. Plenty of glue on each piece. In some cases on the larger segments I had to put several large hose clamps together in order to get enough distance and then it's just get it on top, snug it up, and then wipe off any excess glue, as much excess glue as we can. Clean up our workstation and ready for the next segment. And then this is too. We, we, I think there was 14 layers. So we had to do this 14 times, just gluing, clamping, gluing, clamping, and I'm not going to show you all of the rings, so just to kind of get the idea here. And my trusty companion, Odin, comes in and checks up on me every once in a while to make sure that I'm still working. Sometimes I think maybe just to see if I have a treat kicking around. Or maybe he just wants to help. Anyway, last couple, we um, get them glued up, get the hose clamps on, put them all together, and we're ready to start surfacing and, and uh, gluing. So here's one of the first pieces. I just double stick taped it to a, a plate, just roughly, just to have something to push on. And then that's a piece of the hickory veneer that's glued on there. And you see it's chucked up in a three draw, four draw chuck. I put a, a cut a tendon on a piece of scrap wood that was glued to the back. I did that off camera. Um, got it all set up. So now we're just I'm just cleaning up the inside of the first two layers and getting that piece of veneer smooth. So that it's ready to be glued to the next layer. And we want to keep the keep moving on the interior as each layer progresses so that there's not a whole lot of material to take off when you're out further away from the chuck. You start to develop some um, leverage on that and the less material you have to move, remove the easier the turning is. Plus this thing's going to start necking down pretty soon after a couple of more layers we're going to start going into the neck it's going to get real narrow and we won't be able to reach inside there anymore so turn as you go here's the next ring i have double stick tape it to a piece of plywood and run it through the surface planer to try to get it flat This is one of the smaller rings. This would be one of the rings for either the neck. Yeah, it's for the neck. So that's a piece of black walnut. It's a smaller chuck. There's a little three-jaw chuck that is on the inside of that. And what we're going to do now is just turn the face, get it flat, sand it a little bit, check it, make sure that it's perfectly flat, flip it, do the other side, and then repeat that for each of the subsequent layers. So the piece of steel that I'm using there is actually the back part of the chisel. Um, but it's nice and straight and flat. So I can lay that right on there and look and see if I see daylight anywhere along the edge. And I just true it up a little bit with a block and some sandpaper on it. Once it's good, it comes off of the chuck and the next piece goes on. I think this one that was a little spot, the interior had a little bit of a shadow. Okay, so that's good now, that comes off. Next one goes on. 
this is a, a square nose uh, carbide tip chisel. And I like this one because it, it really does a nice job keeping everything flat. You still have to be a little bit careful with it, but it makes a much smoother, flatter surface than the other chisels do. Or it's much easier to, to make a flat surface. Also found that cutting in from the outside, from the edge, reduces a lot of the chatter rather than coming straight in at it. See, I'm working from the outside and work right in towards the center. That way you're always cutting solid wood. You're not cutting um, the individual high spots. And there's each one, one right after the other. There's a piece of maple. Drew it up, sand it up, flip it. Drew it up, sand it up, flip it. Next. And repeat this for all of the different pieces. And then they can get glued together. There's a little bit of a gluing jig I made for the smaller pieces. It's just a small piece of plastic pipe to try to keep them fairly centered because I wanted to do them in a stack rather than doing them one at a time. Here's the chuck that I'm using to hold everything onto the lead. The chuck didn't really work real well. You can see the tendon is there, cutting that tendon off. Every time I would reposition or reposition the, uh, the decanter, I would have a hard time maintaining um, any kind of a balance. It would always wiggle and wobble a little bit and never could keep it running true. And I know that going forward with more and more layers on, after a while that's going to become a problem. So here I should cut the tendon off. I'm going to put a face plate on it to make it more permanent or a little more secure. That's a piece of scrap wood on the bottom or waste wood anyway. So I cut it off. I figured I could just belt sand it and get it pretty close and then tune it up with a sanding board. Um, but that didn't work real well. So then I thought, well, I can put it on the big stationary sander and get it pretty flat that way. So over to the big stationary sander. And yeah, that didn't work real well either. And it's just that that face plate just, you can see here, it rocks. So somehow I got to get that, that piece of scrap wood perfectly flat. The only way I could think to do it was to bring it over to the CNC machine and use the spoil board bit to trim it. which actually worked really well. One, you'll see once I get this put onto the, mounted back onto the lathe, it, um, it actually rolls really smooth and, and stayed nice and concentric. It really did a good job. I did have one little concern, and you'll see it coming up here in a second. So now I got to mount it to this little face plate, and I got it set up so that it seemed like it was in pretty good order. Little tiny bit of gap there that the next time I take a cut, that'll come right out and true right up. So here's the dilemma. Now I got to screw this face plate to that piece of wood. I can't get a screwdriver in because of the headstock of the lathe is in the way. So once I get this concentric, I tap it a little bit a couple of times to get it to move. And then I'm using the rest, the tool rest, as a guide. And I just look for the gap. And I want to make sure that that gap changes the least amount possible. And you'll see when I hand turn it, that gap stays pretty consistent. Any little variations, those minor tiny variations, almost sand out. Certainly they'll come out with the, the next cutter. So getting back, the problem I have is, okay, I drew a line all the way around. Everybody knows if I take that thing off of there, there's no way that you're going to line that faceplate back up exactly with that line so perfectly that there's not going to be any wobble. And I figured how am I going to do this? Well, 
the best solution that I could come up with was I'll just CA glue it right to that piece of wood, CA glue the wood right to my face plate. I'll worry about getting it off later. I can sand it off, or cut it off. But at least when I take it off the lathe to put the screws into the face plate, I know it's not going to move. And it didn't. It stayed nice and nice and firm. I wouldn't rely on the CA glue just by itself to hold that turning onto the face plate and then turn or sand, but certainly to hold it in place long enough for me to get some screws in it was it worked like a charm. There it's back on the lathe. You can see the screws in there. I found some nice short heavy screws that make it nice and secure. And now I'm back in business. Now I know I can turn it and I don't have to worry about if I take it off of the lathe to glue up another um, layer. I don't have to worry about when I put it back on the chuck being a little bit lodged, slodged or have moved a little bit. So I'm happy with that. So now comes the business of facing off that that layer or that row and then cutting the round or cutting the contour in as we go again with the carbide tip round scraper I would love to use a bowl gouge but I don't have one and I don't have a whole lot of experience with it and I know that if you're not experienced then you can easily get a catch and ruin your workpiece and I really didn't want to take that risk on this I'd rather someday get one and I'll, I'll play around with some scrap wood until I can, I'm comfortable enough to commit it to a, a real turning. So what I'm doing here is just working the inside of the inside of the decanter try to get the contour inside working we're gonna I'm gonna have to eventually start checking the wall thickness and um, get that is get that even so this is the next layer I put that silicone mat down so any anything that drip wouldn't get on my lathe bed and a little bit gun shy of taking it off the lathe because the last couple times I took it off with that other chuck every time I put it back on I got a lot of vibration so I thought this time I would just glue it and use the the live center to uh, put some pressure on the glue joint. It actually worked pretty well. I don't know if it's the ideal setup, but it worked for this case. So here's working the contour, the outside contour, and you can see those dark lines between the those two um, those two rows. That's just a glue line. That's from the different the segments, the flat parts of the segments that haven't been turned out yet. You'll see when it stops that there's um, still some unturned areas there and the dark spot is just, you can see the glue. Eventually that'll turn, will turn deep enough that that will go away. And then at the end, it's just a little bit of sanding will take care of whatever little bit of staining is still there. But they should get cut out here fairly soon. facing off that piece, getting it ready for the next layer. Now I can't go too many more layers before starting to really concentrate on the wall thickness on the interior, but I wanted to get more of the sh exterior shape done first and then work on the inside, but pretty soon the layers are going to become um, small enough that I won't be able to reach in there, so that's going to be important. And you can see those glue spots. So it's going to be important to get in there and get that done. Profile. It after that bulge the bottom, it necks down to a small neck pretty quickly. So this is the transition here, and then the next the next couple of pieces will be fairly small. 
and I think what's going to happen on going forward, maybe get one or two more layers on, and then that stack that I glued together, that'll go on. I'll turn that separately, and then when it's when it's done, I will glue it so that because I don't have a steady rest that I can use, and I don't have time to make one right now. Um, and I'm afraid of it getting out too long and having to put too much strain on it. So this way I can turn that piece, the neck, separately. And then when it's done, I can just glue that whole piece onto what you see there. And then it'll just be a matter of just tuning up that one glue joint and some sanding. And then that won't put very much strain on it, on that faceplate connection at all. This is that round carbide scraper see it there it does a nice job you can work work it on the side or in the front ultimately I'll use the hook scraper to get down inside there probably should have done the interior sooner I waited a little bit too long I should this last layer makes the opening kind of small the last layer was left was still pretty open I could have done it a lot more easily but yeah, we'll get it done there's the hook scraper I can get in there. It's a little grabby. I know they make a S-shaped ready stop or tilt tool stop, tool rest. I don't have one, so I have to use my, my straight tool rests. And you can see that that hook is thin out near the end and then it gets thick right where my hand is. That's why the tool rest is so far from the work piece. I need that big fat wide part to be on the tool rest in order to help prevent that hook from twisting when the uh, when it contacts the wood. And I also have to finish the contour on the outside now. I gotta blend that new ring in to the and get the shape to um, start establishing the shape a little bit more. It should be a little bit more of a dish or concave as it meets that other uh, other disc it should be getting narrower and narrower now and so we'll just work that inside kind of curve there down a little bit and then blend that glue line in and get ready for the next piece There's the next piece kit that's pretty much we speeded things up here a little bit, but you can see that, that kind of blended in. It kind of looks like a cone right now, but I'll get that curve a little established. I wanted to check, I put my fingers in there, I was checking the wall thickness to make sure that I wasn't going to blow through anywhere, but there's still plenty of meat in there, so I can start cutting that down a little bit now and get that, that nice curvy shape. Might have been a little premature releasing the uh, that end, that end support piece of uh, maple that was on there. I could have left that on a little longer, but got that all blended out nicely. Now it's time to glue on transition. Now we're transitioning to maple. So this will be the next piece that goes on. And then after this piece, I'm pretty sure it, we go on to the neck. And the neck, as you saw before, I glued up in one column. So we'll work on that separately, get that all nice and round and smooth, and then we'll glue it to this assembly here, and that'll reduce the amount of strain on the, um, on the end when we're trying to work on the end, and it's just in the, in the chuck you know, in order to work on the inside. I have to work on the inside while it's still just a small cylinder. And then once it's glued onto the, the, the base here, I can put the live center in the end and we'll just work on the outside. I'll blend that last glue joint in and sand everything and then finish it. You still see some glue lines on the maple there. Still needs to Quick check and should be ready to 
Oh, I, we we moved to the other side. I tried the base never really got a lot of love. So I have to blend that. There's a glue line there, and we have to blend the um, big bulge there into the disc that's going to be the base right there. Originally, that piece of maple next to it was going to be the base, but it looks kind of weird. So I think I'm going to wind up just cutting that off, and we'll make the base part of uh, the red uh, ironwood will be the the bottom. The but what I'm sanding there is those two strips of hickory that I put in there, two veneers. They're, I felt kind of rough, so I wanted to uh, see if I could make sure that they were smooth. But here's the neck. That maple on the right is what's going to ultimately get glued to the maple that was just on the base. And then to the left is going to be the actual pour spout at the top of the decanter. So we're going to have to shape all of that, get everything smooth. You see all those facets from the segments. First thing to do is get everything nice and round and then get a nice shape to it. Pretty much in, in pretty good shape here. Time to sand it up a little bit. Still a little bit of a tendon on the end of the um, wenge or the left hand side there where the top is. So we'll have to turn that around and, and get rid of that. But I wanted to get the bulk of the sanding out of the way here while it's between centers and we got plenty of support. Keep everything nice and smooth. That's a 100 or 80 grit sandpaper just to kind of get everything, get all the major scratches and tool marks out. It'll all get a lot more sanding once it's all put together. But for now, I just wanted to have it so that at least it looks presentable while we glue it up to the to the base and to make sure there's nothing that needs to be taken out with the tool while it's still nice and secure yeah I got it in the four jaw chuck finally realized hey I can chuck this up and I can work on the end here now without fear of it flying off although I did get one little catch that did kind of move it a little bit and I had to reposition it. So just nice and easy. Took real light cuts, smoothed out the inside there on the top, and then once that was smooth and looked pretty good, I um, put a Fostner bit in the chuck and ran that through the rest of it, and then it's just a matter of um, sanding the interior to make it smooth. Wound up putting off camera. I put up a, a um, some sandpaper on the end of a stick and just ran that through there a few times just to get it all nice and smooth. Right there is a little bit of glue I was trying to get out. It's still wet, which I don't understand why, but and here's the semi-finished product. You can see that's where the glue joint's going to be. The two pieces of maple will get joined right there and then we'll blend that all together and then everything will get sanded and finished. So right here, we're back on the lathe, just trying to get that final shape on the outside. And I kept stopping and feeling, and felt like there was a little bit of a bump or a lump that I'm trying to get out, trying to make it a little bit smoother, a little bit, a little bit more of a, a smooth curve. Trying to check the, the thickness, and I was comparing that against uh, inside. Wish I had a pair of those calipers that were double ended so you could check the wall thickness more accurately. I was trying to use my fingers. I tried to use those um, calipers, but um, I, I, once I set them, I couldn't get them out. The opening was too small. I have inside calipers, but again, they wouldn't open it up far enough because the uh, opening in the maple. So I had to rely on my fingers to just kind of feel around and check things periodically. And unfortunately, when I was doing that, this happened. A bit of movement, felt kind of thin, and, ugh. and there it is. Now what? 
Turns out that we're on row paper thin. You can see through, you can see the, the light shining through if you look through the hole on the rest of the, the rest of that row. So nothing left to do. Say a couple purple words. The wall thickness in here was substantial, so there's no worries there. So after dancing around a shop, kicking some sawdust, got down to, okay, well, it wouldn't have held up anyway being that thin. So instead of exploding on me later on, at least we got rid of it now. So pull all that off. And what we'll have to do is we'll reface this piece. And again, like I had said in the beginning, some design on the fly may be required. So now it's back to the drawing board. We'll have to cut a couple more segments or segmented rings that will work with this now and I think going forward I'm going to make the rings out of the iron wood the red wood and actually flip that lid around so the darker end is facing down and the uh, lighter maple is where the pour spout will be so not the end of the world but a little bit of a setback so Anyway, back to, we'll face this off, get this nice and smooth, and once it's smooth and straight and there's a little bit of a, or enough of an area to glue, there's about a half an inch of gluing surface there, which should be, should be fine. And we'll make a new segment, get that nice and flat, and we'll glue the new segment right on there. So here's the three new segments laid out. There's the neck, that's how it's going to go on, dark side down. Here's the boards, cut to length and width. And finally, all the segments ready to be glued into new rings. And so here's the new rings, glued on, shaped. Just doing a little bit of sanding on the interior, get that wall thickness where I want it and get it smooth. So when we coat the inside, there's no ridges or anything. So here's the neck. We have to square off this piece so we can turn it around and glue it to that piece that we just faced. So I wanted to put a piece of black walnut just on the very lip. This piece was a little bit too small. I wanted to look around maybe in the, in the scrap pile see if I could find something that was closer to that size or maybe a little bit bigger. This one kind of matched. I was hoping to be a little bit bigger, but it's already round. So this one's a winner. We'll glue it up and once I get it on there and turned, we can turn out those those marks that are in the, uh, in the maple you see there from the chuck. We'll get rid of those and get it all nice and smooth. Okay, so here we're all glued up and just need to now blend that neck into the body. Of course, I'm looking at the video and realizing that how smart it was to leave that square washer in the end there that I used when I chucked up the, the gluing thing. So now I've got four knife points spinning around right near my hand. So don't do this at home. Anyway, once I realized um, I did take that off, and switch it with a piece of wood, round wood, so that I wouldn't have to worry about having that saw blade spinning around right by, right near my hand.
Oh, hey. So I've got the segmented turning all sanded, and I'm just getting ready to apply a finish. My choice is going to be Odie's Oil. No affiliation. I don't have them up sponsored by them or anything. I just happen to like this. It's um, a, a wax and oil finish. It gets right into the grain of the wood. It does a really nice job. Smells good. It's non-toxic. It's food safe. So what's not to like? Um, simple way to put it on. They suggest you use a white scotch bright type of a cloth. I don't like that because it tends to do a little bit of scratching and I got this sanded up to 600 grit so I want to maintain that smooth finish. So I'm just going to use a little terry cloth towel and a tiny bit goes a long way and I'm just going to let it run on the lathe here and just kind of let it get worked into the right into the grain of the wood and uh, I'll get you a little bit closer you can take a look So I'm just going to rub this in. And then what you're supposed to do is let it dry for a little bit, a couple minutes, half an hour, and then wipe off any excess. So I'll get this all on there real good. Okay, so if you like what I've been doing so far and you want to see more, please hit that um, subscribe button and uh, the like button. That'll help me out a lot with my channel. We have a lot of uh, interesting projects coming up and uh, don't want you to miss out on any of them. Okay, so hit those buttons and help us out and I'll see you again soon. Thanks. Okay, so it's been a little while going to see what we can do about see what I can do about buffing this up now I'll take the excess off I get a clean terry cloth towel and just rub the excess off I'm not going to turn the lathe on for this part because I found that this stuff's a little bit gummy even as it's drying and it tends to pull the terry cloth apart when it, the lathe is spinning. It's not really, I guess they use it a lot on tabletops and stuff, but um, on a spinning thing, spinning piece, it seems like it it starts to pull the terry cloth apart a little bit and I start getting all those little fuzzies embedded in it. So I'm just going to wipe it down by hand and it's, you can see it's coming up pretty nice and it it'll be even better after a couple more coats it'll really start to shine. Then we'll have to cut it off the lathe and fix the base a little bit now for the scary part, I need to part this off of the faceplate and I kind of want the base to still be the red ironwood, not the maple. But looking inside before I realized that I cut all the way into the maple. So that means that there's going to be a hollow spot in here and I'm going to have to plug that with, with a piece of wood later to seal it up or I could cut the maple uh, and see how that looks I know the screws these are the screws so I know the screws only go as far as this piece of scrap wood so I know I can cut into the maple without any worrying about hitting any screws I don't know maybe I will cut it back here first and see how it looks let's try that well, let's give it a try. Bring the RPMs up to 700. And there goes nothing. So that wobble that you see between the maple and the bloodwood was caused when I was having trouble getting the 
four jaw chuck to seat up properly each time we removed it from the from the lathe. You can't really notice it when it's just sitting still, only when it's spinning. So I decided to put this shipping blanket here just in case this thing goes for a ride. I might be able to save a few scratches. Of course now I can't find the on switch. Okay, that's about as far as I am comfortable going with the cutoff tool. I think I will finish this off now with a handsaw and see what we wind up with. I'm just afraid of it snapping and becoming a top, spinning around the shop. Lock that. And there we go. Okay, so I did not get so far in that we open it's still solid wood there. Uh, we'll see how that looks. We sand it up a little bit. Might not look so bad with that little bit of maple on there. <laughs> 